Well, yesterday we had the blessing of saying goodbye to a really, really good man, Brother Bob McCracken, um, a godly man, a kind man, a loving encourager, uh, one of the men that made Broadway smell like Jesus. And uh, we miss Bob and we certainly pray for his family. I want to commend Andy and JV. They did a wonderful job in taking care of his funeral service yesterday. Our preacher has given us a great vision in this uh, theme that we have uh, beyond the walls. That is Jesus' theme. That is the Great Commission. That is what God wants us to be, the church beyond the walls. The church had no walls in the first century. Uh, unless they borrowed one, uh, they didn't have a building usually in the first century. Uh, they met at all kinds of different places. And uh, Dustin did a great job of kicking off this series. I was in New England uh, last week at, uh, preaching on some lectures up there. And with a young man named David Rollert, who's doing a wonderful job. He's one of our Global Preacher Training graduates. He's teaching and baptizing people up there. And uh, I understand that Jed did a great job last week talking about going beyond the walls and reaching our families with the message of Christ. Today we're talking about, the, the, the title that was given to me was, It's About People. Let me clarify that. Yes, it's about people, but it's not about the perceived needs of people. It's not about pleasing people. It's about God's rescuing people who are separate from Christ, alienated from citizenship in Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. It's about rescuing the lost. The Son of Man came to uh, seek and to save that which is lost. And yes, that's all about people. It's about the eternal souls of people. Jesus gave us the message of reconciliation and the ministry of of reconciliation. People that God loves enough to send his own son are separated from God. And God loves those people so much and cares so much about those people that he wants to use us people to reach out to those people. Why in the world did God want people to reach other people? I mean, why didn't he just fly a C-140 over and drop Bibles out of the airplane? That's not his plan. Remember, The parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8, we all quote the verse, the seed is the word of God. But do you realize there was a sower that went out to sow the seed? There's always been people connected to sharing the message of Christ with other people. So it is the church's job collectively. Dustin was trying to tell us about about uh, we're not in this by ourselves, and that we don't all have the same role, but it's the church's job collectively to reach the lost. It's our job to teach the lost. It's our job then to grow and equip the lost to be good members of the church until we present each one complete in Christ, Colossians 1.28. And it's our job to keep the lost Faithfully in the church until they die. See, when they're reconciled. That's all of our job together. It's not one people. Now, we can't hire it done, brothers and sisters. Now, we've always been soul winners. I've been trying all my life to bring souls to Jesus one at a time. And this young man's doing that over here. He's bringing souls to Jesus. But we can't hire our job as a church done. It's going to take all of us together as a body to do what our preacher is calling us to do, go beyond the walls. Each one of us has a part in that, a function in that. So reaching the lost is a process involving the whole church. It's a cooperative effort. Ephesians 4.16 talks about Christ from whom the whole body, fitly framed and knit together through that which every joint supplies, According to the working in due measure of each individual part causes the growth of the body under the building up of itself in love. So when we're all doing our part in this process of reaching the lost, that's when the body of Christ grows. Now this says over here we've got to be consistent and we've got to be courageous and we've got to be committed. 
Uh, let me uh, suggest that the first thing we've got to be is committed. And we're not going to be committed until the word of God has sunk into my mind and your mind. And it has convicted us and converted us and changed us to where we believe that being a Christian and reaching the lost is the mission of our lives. Then we'll be committed to this cause. Now, John 1, verse 41 and 42 speaks of a simple guy that we don't read much about in the Bible. His name was Andrew. And it simply said that Andrew went and found his own brother, Simon Peter. And he, Andrew, brought him, Peter, to Jesus. Now, that's the function of a lot of people in the body of Christ. One author has said that some people are bringers, like Andrew was... Some people are teachers, and remember the Bible said, Be not many of you teachers, for yours is the heavier judgment. Some people are keepers, and as we have this lesson this morning, I want you to be thinking and praying about where you fit into this kind of threefold division of labor in the Lord's body. Are you a bringer? Like Andrew just brought his brother and said, Come on, I think we found the Messiah. Could you come and meet this guy? He was a bringer. See? And he just brought somebody to the teacher who could teach him. And then there are teachers, and there are not a great number of those. There are a few here that will sit down and will really teach someone the gospel. Brother Gary can do it. Brother Gary Hoyt. Brother uh, Dustin's fully capable. I'm going to do it. There's several others here. Some of you ladies that have taught people, and you can do it. There's a number of us that can do it. But uh, there are not as, as, as many teachers as there are bringers. But then there's the keepers, and oh boy, do we need those. And we're going to talk seriously about that in just a minute. But it takes all of us holding hands. It takes all of us working together. It takes all of us being on the same page. It takes all of us knowing what we're about. And what we're about, church, is the saving of the lost. And the maturing of the lost. And the keeping of the lost. So we can go to heaven together. That's what we're about. We must, first of all, commit to openly being Christians in every environment. Now, when I was a late teenager, maybe a junior in high school, maybe a little bit before that, I had a paradigm shift in my head. I thought about bringing a little Bible up here. I've got a little Bible in my desk that's this big. It's a New Testament, and it's a little King James Bible. And I carried that thing in my back pocket in my jeans to school at Kelly Walsh High School in Casper, Wyoming. And in Lincoln High School in Denver, Colorado. And I taught my friends the gospel out of that little bitty Bible. See? But I had a paradigm shift when I was a kid. And that paradigm shift was, look, Dan, you've been a little bit shy about your Christianity. You've been a little bit ashamed to really be public with it in front of your friends. You've been embarrassed on a football team sometime about being a Christian. You've been a little bit like, well, you're a Christian, but you're in the closet being a Christian. I came out when I was about a junior in high school. And I came out that I am a Christian. That's who I am. And I'm going to be a Christian every single day at school and at home and at work at Safeway or at Albertsons unloading trucks or whatever. I'm going to be a Christian. That's who I am. And I want you to know it. And I'm not ashamed of it. And you know what? When I stopped being ashamed of it, other people accepted it just fine. See? But we've got to commit ourselves not to just being on a team. That's not, what, that's not what being a Christian is. I'm not just part of a team. It's not a hobby that we have being a Christian. It's not a weekend pastime that we have being a Christian. It's an identity that we have or not. And if we don't have this identity then we're not going to be committed, and we can forget about the other two on that chart, see? But who am I? I am a Christian. I'm openly Christian. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. One died for all, and therefore all died. And one died for all so that those that live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died and rose again. So I go out into this world every day, and I'm openly Christian. Can you be openly Christian? Aren't you tired of people talking about people who are openly gay 
or openly this or openly that. How about openly Christian? Openly Christian. Unashamedly Christian. Always Christian. 24-7. Consistently Christian. Uh, Obviously Christian. How do I do that? Well, I've got to be a Christian. How can I do that At home, I can be kind and be loving and be prayerful at home. How can I do that at work? I can be helpful and I can be trustworthy every day and I can be concerned and show that concern to my co workers and really take an interest in their life. And I can be a servant every day and I can be interested to them and I can be alerted to their needs and I can talk about my blessings. The Lord has blessed me this way and that way without being ashamed of that at all. And I might even put a post-it note up on my desk or in my cubicle at work that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Or maybe a post-it note up there by my computer that says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I'm a Christian. I'm openly a Christian, and just being these things inspires trust, it engenders respect in people, and it opens doors for sharing Christ with people. Then next, if we're going to be a team and do this as we need to do, we must engage people intentionally. we got to go out there and not be, you know, we just walk through life like this. We don't talk to anybody We don't meet anybody. We don't smile at anybody, especially if we don't know anybody. We're not going to do anything with them. Look, engage people. Some of us are normally, uh, naturally gregarious people. We're friendly people. We greet people. Try this greeting people. Say hello to people. Watch their face light up if you say hello to them and greet them. Learn their name. What's your name? Call them by their name. Greet those people. Converse with those people. Have you lived here very long? Do you have any children? Uh, Where do you work? Uh, How long have you lived here in Paducah, etc.? Inquire about people. Uh, Visit with people. Talk with people. Oh, they'll think I'm crazy. No, they don't. I do it all the time everywhere. Maybe they do think I'm crazy, but I meet people and greet people because ever since I was a teenager, I've thought in my mind I'm a soul winner. And in order to be a soul winner, I'm going to have to meet people. And I'm going to have to care about people. I'm going to have to talk to people. And I'm going to have to build relationships with people. We must engage people. The Bible says in Colossians 4 verse 5, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Are you doing that? Or are you just willy-nilly going about your days around outsiders? Be wise. In the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. That's a modus operandi for a bringer. We need bringers out there. Even if you're not a teacher, you can do these things. Now what do we do after we get used to engaging people? What's going to happen is you're going to be engaging people everywhere you go. And as you go to those places more than one time, whether it's the health club or the bank or the store or wherever it is, you're going to repeatedly engage people. So we must work at building personal relationships with those people. You go to the bank window and you say, hi, Tina, how's your husband? What's been going on with you guys? You go over here and you say, Jacob, how's that new little baby girl of yours? And you start talking to those people and they learn your name and you know theirs. And pretty soon there's a rapport going between you. You know, you're at the health club and you're running on the treadmill beside this guy. And you've learned all about him and you've learned about his family and you've learned about his interests. And when he has a problem, you ask him about it and you know about it and you say, well, let's pray about that together. And you start building a relationship with those people. Don't be fake. You're not trying to sell them a product or trying to get money off of them or anything like that. Don't be fake. Be real. Make real friends. Be a friend to them whether they ever turn their head toward Christ or not. Be real friend. And based on this relationship that you build with these people out there, 
this relationship of kindness, this relationship of interest, this relationship of respect, this relationship of service, then comes the point where we must connect those people to God's church. Now, you as a bringer, if you're going to be a bringer, you need to figure out what the doorways are unto this church. I'm not talking about that door. I'm not talking about that door over there. There are entry points into this church where you can take these people that you've begun to develop good relationships with. They know you're a Christian. And you're going to introduce them to some other people who are Christians who will help them in their journey toward Christ. Great, great opportunity we have. I was reading my book, and I think we're supposed to go out to Damon and Deborah's house next Sunday night. Am I right about that? And we're supposed to have a good time together. Invite somebody out there that's not a member of the Lord's church. And love them and show them a good time and introduce them to some other good, sweet Christian people. Invite them to a young couples fellowship if a group of you are getting together. Some people that you'll meet out there have teenage kids. Oh my goodness, I've got teenagers. What am I going to do with them? They have teenage kids. Invite them to a youth activity where they'll have fun and meet other young people, other children. Some people you meet at the soccer field or up at the school activities or whatever, they have little children. We've got a great children minister who's a pretty good worship leader too. And, and you, could, you could invite those kids to a ch children's activity where they could meet other families with children and introduce them to. Some of you know some widows or widowers recently out there in the community. Why don't you invite those widows or widowers to Tuesday senior meeting here and get them to know some sweet Christian people that can help lead them to Christ. That's a doorway into the church and it's a ripe field out there. The widows and the widowers who need Jesus Christ in their life. How about a Wednesday evening meal? A bunch of you out there know people that they wouldn't, wouldn't mind coming to a Wednesday evening meal and having a meal there and meeting some nice people and, and being introduced to some Christians. Many of you know some ladies. You may know some single ladies. You may know some widow women. You may know some young women who are family ladies that are interested in God. How about inviting them to ladies class on Thursday? There's been a lot of people that have sat in that ladies class. And then from that ladies class, we've had Bible studies and baptized people into Christ. That's a great doorway. How about Wednesday, Wednesday evening class? There's all kinds of opportunities here. There are doorways galore into this church. This is where, church, listen to me. This is where when we have guests, it's vitally important, whether it's in ladies' class or over at Damon's house or whether it's in the Wednesday evening meal, it's vitally important that we embrace our guests, that we show kindness toward them, that we spend time with them, that we talk with them, that we're friendly toward them, that we create an environment that's a welcoming environment here for people because that's what Jesus would do. But now we've got to be sure to connect friends to teachers. Do you realize that just making friends with people and just having them come to class with you is not the end goal? We love people and we want to see people saved eternally. So in order to be saved eternally, they need to hear the gospel of Christ. They need a teacher to sit down and teach them clearly and plainly the gospel of Christ. In that uh, uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul said, pray for us too. He's talking about the teachers that God may open a door for our message. Now, I pray that often. I wanted this song today because lead me to some soul today. Teach me, Lord, just what to say. But we need a bunch of bringers who are aware to, to lead the, the people to the teachers so that we can teach this message. He says, pray for us too that God may open a door for our message that we may Proclaim the mystery of Christ. And then he says, pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. We're going to clearly and lovingly and plainly teach the gospel of Christ to people. So they understand it and so they obey it. And so they're added to the Lord. And then the teachers need to keep teaching. We're not done teaching when we've taught people about reconciliation and baptism. We need to keep teaching and building people up in the body of Christ... 
So that brings us to the fact that keepers must work to encourage and involve new Christians. Church, listen to me. Some of you may be these people. Being a keeper is a vital role in the Lord's church. The process of of reaching out to the lost and reconciling them to God means little if they quickly fall away from God and they never come back again. One of the things we've always had an issue with here at Broadway, we'll just call it like we see it, if you go back to our earlier church growth studies that we had a couple times over the years, our front door is wide open, church. Our front door is wide open. We have visitors and everything, and we can have more. You know what the problem is? Our back door is wide open. Our back door is so far open that people go out the back door as fast as they come in the front door sometimes. we got to close the back door. And the only way we can close the back door is to be keepers. We have to take a concerted interest in people when they're baptized into Christ. We've got to have people here that are dedicated to helping people, to encouraging people, to keeping track of people, to maturing people in the faith. Uh, certainly, we've, we've got to be examples to those people. And not just the leaders need to be doing this and shepherding, but all of us together who are keepers need to be doing this. So being a keeper is something that is so, so important for the Broadway church to grow in the future. Are you a keeper? Would you like to make that the ministry uh, for your life, being a keeper? Some of you are helping greatly at that. Now, let's look at this side, I guess. We're supposed to be committed, consistent, and courageous in doing this. First thing's commitment. I can just holler about this all over the place. It's not going to make one bit of difference unless you are committed to being a Christian wherever you are openly. That's step number one. If you can be committed to being a Christian openly everywhere you go, then you'll find that consistency. You'll always be thinking about souls. You'll always be thinking about people. You'll always be thinking about little things you can do to help people come. And the courage to engage people will come with this paradigm shift in in your mind when you decide to be a Christian openly. When you're, when you're no longer ashamed of the fact of who you are, and you just are, the courage will come, and you'll make friends, and you'll change people's lives, as many of you already do. we got to have bringers, church. Let me hear an amen. And then we got to have teachers, and then we got to have a bunch of keepers. This is what we need to do if we're going to do what our preacher has put before us and go outside beyond the walls. Okay? May God bless us to hear this. Why are we talking about this? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive the deeds done in the body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or evil. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Why are we doing this? Because Romans 14.12. Each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. And so shall all of them out there. Let's go outside the walls, church. And let's do as God wants us to do. If you're here today and you already understand the gospel. If you already know that you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And turn from sin. And be baptized into Jesus Christ. We'd love to help you with that today. If we can help you with any other need, please come as we stand together. If the name of the Savior is precious.